foremost, please allow me to acknowledge and thank our anonymous donors who, through their generosity, have so enriched our lives here at Goldwyn Smith Hall and my colleagues in the creative writing program whose hard work and vision have made this series and the program here at Cornell such a success. Thank you, Laurel Guy and Marianne Marsh. Where's Marianne? Marianne Hi. Marsh, always, always for all you do to keep us sane. Thank you, Terrence, for finding time in your full schedule to come to Ithaca. Finally, thank you all for being here. I am sure after hearing Terrence read, you will be thanking yourselves all the way home. <laughs> be sure to buy Terrence's books on the way out, which John has for sale on the table up here, and you can thank yourself into perpetuity. Um, also, Go to the Writers at Cornell blog to listen to J. Robert Lennon's interviews with our visiting writers. And the website is writersatcornell.blogspot.com. All right. I like to give folks a taste of what gets said about them behind their backs when they come to visit. When I mention Terrence to the general populace out here, I hear most often, oh my gosh, I love his work. Often followed by, and have you seen him? <laughs> like particularly good food perversely makes me want to go into the kitchen and slap the chef. Terrence Hayes' poems make me almost angrily joyous. When I last saw Terrence at the Callaloo Conference in Baltimore, Maryland, he casually approached the podium, reached into his back pocket, and pulled out a sheaf of poems that took off the top of my head. They were about Elizabeth Cotton, a black American musician who, by the way, lived up the road in Syracuse, and whose self-taught, left-handed style, she played the guitar upside down, which required playing the bass line with her fingers and the melody with her thumb, influenced just about any guitarist in America that you can think of her name right now and added the phrase cotton picking to the American lexicon. As I sat in the audience in Baltimore and listened to Terrence Reed, I honestly found myself thinking, how dare he write a poem that good? He must be out his cotton picking mind. <laughs> Anyone who wants a glimpse of our country at the precipice its images and language turned upside down and played left-handed and made more real and dazzling by and read muscular music and hip logic and wind in a box. Brand names crowd the poems of muscular music, a collection filled with an angry humor that stops you and makes you think, where are my goddamn fries? The speaker in What I Am demands, ain't I American? And in Buy One, Get One, the speaker quietly wonders, how much do I deserve? Rereading Terrence's work in the context of this historical moment and the week that is to come, I ask myself, do we deserve this beautiful American poet? He makes us smile, but he does not spare us. Instead, he lays out our options clearly. In Yummy's Sweets Blues, here come the death rush, hit the road. What happens when a dream explodes? Does it hush? And in some luminous distress, he warns, not even tomorrow can save us. In the collection, When in a Box, we see the sky above a mother's face, the day her husband leaves for war. No blood and stars, but the blood and stars. Let's find it and break its fucking neck. Let's break its fucking jaw. Let's break its fucking ganged in vessels. And if it pushes back and a tiny blue rub and a tiny blue rises on its cheek, let's break that too until stars dance in the corners of its eyes like white seeds. And let's break those too until all the words we know are split in two. That poem ends with. Aren't you tired? Let's lie down. Let's cry out and rest. And that really, really has been resonating for me as we approach next week and all of the things that could and might and would and won't and will and possibly are going to happen. 
Tired or no, I find myself drawn again and again to the possibility in the poem that introduced us to Terence. The first poem from that first collection, Muscular Music, where he was teaching us something we used to know at Pegasus. They are like those crazy women who tore Orpheus when he refused to sing. These men grinding in the strobe and black lights of Pegasus, all shadow and sound. I'm just here for the music, I tell the man who asked me to the floor, but I have held a boy on my back before. Curtis and I used to leap barefoot into the creek dance among maggots and piss, beer bottles and tadpoles slippery as sperm. We used to pull off our shirts and slap music into our skin. He wouldn't know me now at the edge of these lovers' gyre, glitter and steam, fire, bodies blurred, sexless by the music's spinning light. A young man slips his thumb into the mouth of an old one, and I am not that far away the whole scene raw and delicate as Curtis's foot gashed on a sunken bottle shard. They press hip to hip, each breathless as a boy carrying a friend on his back, the foot swelling green as the sewage in that creek. We never went back, but I remember his weight better than I remember my first kiss. These men know something I used to know, how could I not find them beautiful the way they dive and spill into each other, the way the dance floor takes them wet and holy in its mouth? As we're thinking about the possibility of climbing onto somebody's back like that in this country and, and expecting them to just carry us. Um, please welcome Terrence Hayes. So you know I don't I don't really have a voice, but can y'all hear me? You can hear me? Okay, that's good. Let's crank it you. I gotta pat my brow. I always think like praise makes me sweat. <laughs> you know what it, it does. It's like, oh God, I can't I can't follow that. <clears throat> I was really thinking you should uh you should read my poems is what I was thinking. I could just give you the book. You know, I'm sorry, it's a little hard to hear you, but is it hard? How about that? I, I can't go up any louder. You can come up to the front. <laughs> Come on, you come sit right there, man. <clears throat> we'll talk. All right, uh, that just means you got to be very quiet because I've been running my mouth. I like to talk, and that's why I don't have a voice. <clears throat> Although I made a confession to the kids this morning. I was telling them, you know, I like to smoke one cigarette a day. I have, like, this cigarette roller, and then I just push it, and I smoke one cigarette, and then I write. So I was thinking, damn, I guess I got to stop smoking. I don't smoke out of the house, nobody knows, except for my wife. And now I just told you. <laughs> I think that means I'm gonna stop. But that means I'll stop being a poet too. We're superstitious. All right, okay. Uh, 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 we're gonna go. I will, uh, since this book is here, I guess I should read like one poem from it, so I will. Um, and I'll read some stuff from, uh, in the box, but I do have like some new stuff that I want to try. So, uh, just so you can't say I didn't read anything that you couldn't get. This is the last poem in, uh, in Hip Logic, the same city. The rain falling on a night in mid-December, I pull to my stepfather's engine, wondering how long I remember this. His car is dead. He connects jumper cables to his battery, then to mine, without looking in at me and the child. Water beads on the windshield, the road sign, his thin blue coat. I'd get out now, prove I can stand with him in the cold, but he told me to stay with the infant. I wrap her in the blanket, staring for what seems like a long time into her open, toothless mouth, and I wish she was mine. I feed her an orange, softened first in my mouth, chew gently as the juice runs down my fingers while I squeeze it into hers. What could any of this matter 
to another man passing on his way to his family. His radio deafening the sound of water and breathing along all the roads bound to his. But to rescue a soul is as close as anyone comes to God. Think of Noah lifting a small black bird from its nest. Think of Joseph raising a son that wasn't his. Let me begin again. I want to be holy. In rain, I pulled to my father's car with my girlfriend's infant. She was pregnant when we met, but we'd make love. We'd make love below stars and shingles while the baby kicked in the world between us. Perhaps a man whose young child bears his face, whose wife waits as he drives home through rain and darkness, perhaps that man will call me a fool. So what? There is one thing I'll remember all my life. It is as small and holy as the mouth of an infant. It is speechless. When his car would not stir, my father climbed in beside us, took the orange from my hand, took the baby in his arms. In 1974, this man met my mother for the first time as I cried or slept in the same city that holds us tonight. If you ever tell my story, say that's the year I was born. Can y'all hear me? How was that? I think I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna, I'm done. Uh, that's it for today. I'm just kidding. You do like a Q&A or something for an hour. I don't think they would pay me for that though. All right. Let me get some water. I need my voice, I rely on this thing. This is terrible. That's almost right. Look, that's almost right. <clears throat> that's almost how it sounds. Uh, so I'll read some stuff from Wind in a Box. Let's see what we got. I'm thinking I should just read really quiet poems because uh, I don't want to get too excited, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> like this blue baraka. I shouldn't do that. Okay, let me see. Oh, I can read this one quietly. Uh, I like the blue Seuss. Um, just a few poems from here. So uh, what can I say? You know, I got a bunch of poems that are sort of persona poems, um, but a lot of the persona poems are really just me. Uh, so it's like, you know, Dr. Seuss thinking about African American. We can frame this in the context of, uh, I'm remembering a bunch of stuff. I was thinking, I got to talk about Barack Obama today. And I was supposed to say thanks to everybody. I didn't say anything. I'm so ungracious. So yeah, uh, so this poem can be thought about in the context of black black people coming up to this moment. That's my Barack Obama quote. And thank y'all for having me. Lai Ray and Laurel and Helena. The grad students are really good, very charming. They just talked because I couldn't talk, so they kept talking. <laughs> the undergrads, undergrads were good. Who else? Let me see. Ah, uh, the cable's good. Watch some news from CNN because I don't have cable. <laughs> All right, so yeah, the blue suits. Okay, so I, this, I think this has something to do with, with like with Tuesday. I think it does. Blacks in one box, blacks in two box, blacks on blacks stacked in boxes stacked on boxes, blacks in boxes stacked on shores, blacks in boxes stacked on boats in darkness. Blacks in boxes do not float. Blacks in boxes count their losses. Blacks on boat docks, blacks on auction, blacks on wagons, blacks with masters in the houses, blacks with bosses in the fields, blacks in helmets toting rifles, blacks in Harlem toting banjos, boots, and quilts, blacks on foot, blacks on buses, blacks on backwood, hardwood stages singing blues, Blacks on Broadway singing too. Blacks can Charleston, blacks can foxtrot, blacks can bebop, blacks can moonwalk, blacks can beatbox, blacks can run fast too. Blacks on blacks and blacks on knees and blacks on couches, blacks on good times, blacks on roots, blacks on Cosby. Blacks in voting booths are blacks in boxes. Blacks beside blacks in rows of houses are blacks in boxes too. So there's one that seems apropos. <laughs> seems apropos. Uh, let me see here. So y'all can hear me about in the back. Can y'all hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so I read another one of these. 
See, like that one too, like I really wanted to get excited, you know, with my full, my full voice. Um, I guess this is different. It's just a different kind of poem reading it this way. Uh, so the blue cool, I'll read that one too. So as I said, just sprinkled through the book are these poems and voices. Um, so like, you know, I was in a, had I written this poem? I don't think I'd written it yet. I was at Yale and I was hanging out with a friend who was in the Yale program. And he was like, hey man, I heard like who Keith. Yo, who knows who Cool Keith is? Y'all know, raise your hand, you know about Dr. Octagon, Black Elvis. Yeah, cool. Anyway, so uh, he was like, yeah, man, I think Cool Keith is gonna be reading, I mean, gonna be performing down the street. And you know, he's like a real way underground. He's been like uh, in a few insane asylums a couple of times. Uh, they're very eccentric. Uh, he likes, you know, I think he has like a butt fetish. <laughs> All this works out, you know, I'll wreck your rectum. <laughs> you know, ain't it saying nothing? You know, it's just like crazy in every poem, every 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 song. So anyway, so we go, and it's like all these backpacker kids. Y'all know about the backpacker kids, you know, whatever. Backpacker hip hop, and so we're the oldest ones in there, of course. Me and this guy who's like a PhD student. So we're in the back, and it's crowded and smoky, and there's peanut shells on the floor. And there on the stage is Cool Keith, and he's doing all of this with this voice that I, it's almost like a Mike Tyson sort of. If you imagine Mike, Mike Tyson rapping, something like that. <laughs> doing this, you know. And so then it's done, and I was like, I'm gonna go get a t-shirt. And I go up and he looks, he's like, hey, what are y'all doing in here? Because you know, we like the only other black guys in there, other than him, <laughs> on the stage. And we're like, what are you doing here? So he gave me a t-shirt. So then I thought, oh, I wanna do a poem, like I think in the voice of Koo Keith. So this is your introduction to Koo Keith. There's only one but reference in here. <laughs> the blue Koo. Yo. You soft as the flesh beneath my thumbnails. That's why I cut you. I'm that third rail, that live wire. Yeah, I'm that PI for hire, that dark age surf made spire. You need to say your prayers. You need to believe your naysayers. Those parachute pants you wear are baffling. There's hot air in your bread basket, you penny loafer. I got a chauffeur, I'm laughing. My tour bus behind your limousine no, you're two of us behind my limousine. Boy, you can't pass it. I'm too cool. I freeze the wannabes. I melt the moon. I hand my butler my top hat. I tease my afro with my afro pick. My head is on right. I am fur collared, cashmere, double down, diamond button, trench coat. You goodwill jacket. You anti hazardous. You crack to my angel dust. You better run before you get your butt kicked, you plastic, spastic, you manic, matchstick. I'm hot like that sunlight and classic rock. I'm that black Elvis, that black Bach. I'm too cool. I grind my pelvis, my back crack, your mama back crack too. I give her love bites. I'm daddy to you. <laughs> Brush your teeth, empty your bladder before you greet me. That fat girl call you honey. All her kids call you daddy, the bastards. You have my sympathy, but you can't have my money. Don't write no symphonies or rap songs about me. Your style is lousy. Yeah, boy, I'm too cool. Don't talk about me. <laughs> so that's, that's cool Keith, I think. <laughs> All right, let me see if I can read. I, I, I thought in the room that if I just read very serious poems, I could sort of get over. But then I see I start reading that kind of stuff. <laughs> let me see here, some serious stuff. Uh, well, here's one, uh, The Whale. So, you know, my cousin Purvis is an uh, interesting guy. You know, he likes poetry, but he, he works in prison. He used to be in the Navy. He's got big old arms. He thinks he looks like LL Cool J. He doesn't, but <laughs> he's got tattoos. So, but he likes, he like reads all kinds of stuff. He likes like Ernest Gaines. He's taking an interest in my work. <clears throat> he asked me to give him money when he got his big SUV towed away. You know, you see it kind of person. So anyway, so he said, hey man, you need to write a poem for me because you know, when I be telling these girls that we related, they don't believe me. So I was like, all right, okay. So uh, this, this poem is, is for him. It's called The Whale. But I, I didn't tell him that the poem was in the book when I gave it to him. The Whale. Just like that, your father's dead. Half of all the footsteps you've made in your lifetime swept away by the tide, gnawing the shore. The bits of shells like fragments of bone and teeth sinking into the sand beneath you 
as you walk toward the people crowding the body of a young whale, a boy on the shoulders of his father, a woman slipping film into a camera, the skin peeling on a lifeguard's neck as he stoops peering into the animal's eye, saying nothing, the audience silent or silenced by the sound of salt water sweet-talking the shore as if sweet-talking the earth from her prom dress, the tide stroking its hands along her inner thigh and finding the crop of razor bumps like the humped tiny backs of shells and smiling at the thought of the girl preparing for her prom date, the hair lathered and shaved away, the air leaving ripples inside the dress as the knee-high hem is lifted above the girl's waist and breast, the sound of the silk passing over her body like the sound of the tide uncovering and then covering the hard news of the day, the news returning each time it's washed away. Okay, so now I can't take my coat off, I'm hot. But it's got this thing on it, so let me just wipe my brow. So anyway, uh, you know, so that's a poem about him and his dad, his dad had died. And, I mean, I guess this is sort of related, you know, like I went through this whole thing of trying to find my dad. And uh, Purvis's dad was the only one who said, uh, oh yeah, I know him, and then like a month later he died. So I thought, all right, this poem, oh, you're gonna have me out, right? All right, thanks. So, uh, thanks. So, um, anyway, so I didn't tell him that the poem was in the book, because you know, it's about his dad, and it's serious, and he's real macho. So he had it, and it looked like probably six months, seven months go by, and uh, he called me, and he's like, hey man, uh, I was looking through that book, and uh, I saw that poem, The Whale. Give me a fucking call. <laughs> I didn't call him back, though. I'm not gonna say anything. What, what can I say? You know, it's a crazy poem. Uh, let me see. What? Okay, I'm gonna read. Uh, oh, I have some requests. I guess I'll do some requests. So there are a few poems in here uh, titled "Wind in the Box." And they just sort of share the same title. I don't think uh, I've been trying to argue that there's, there's no relationship. They just happen to have the same title, but nobody believes that. <laughs> well, here's one: "Wind in the Box" after Lorca. I want to always sleep beneath a bright red blanket of leaves. I want to never wear a coat of ice. I want to learn to walk without blinking. I want to outlive the turtle and the turtle's father, the stone. I want a mouth full of permissions and a pink glistening bud. If the wild flower and anthill can return after sleeping each season, I want to walk out of this house wearing nothing but wind. I want to greet you. I want to wait for the bus with you weighing less than a chill. I want to fight off the bolts of gray lighting the alcoves and winding paths of your hair. I want to fight off the damp nudgings of snow. I want to fight off the wind. I want to be the wind and I want to fight off the wind with its sagging banner of isolation, its swinging screen doors, its gilded boxes and neatly folded pamphlets of noise. I want to fight off the dull straight lines of two by fours and endings, your disapprovals, your doubts and regulations, your carbon copies. If the locust can abandon its suit, I want a brand new name. I want the pepper's fury and the salt's tenderness. I want the virtue of the evening rain, but not its gossip. I want the moon's intuition but not its questions. I want the malice of nothing on earth. I want to enter every room in a strange electrified city and find you there. I want your lips around the bell of flesh at the bottom of my ear. I want to be the mirror, but not the nightstand. I do not want to be the light switch. I do not want to be the yellow photograph or book of poems. When I leave this body woman, I want to be pure flame I want to be your song. Uh, let's see here. All right, uh, well maybe I'll come back to some of this. I, I do really want to try out some poems, some new poems. So you know the craziest thing about new poems is that sometimes they're bad. <laughs> so you know, you sort of want to end with them. You don't want to start with them, but you don't want to end with them either. 
So I figure I just gotta put this one in the middle. So let me see if I can describe this thing that I'm trying to do. Uh, Picha Kucha, you might know Picha Kucha. It's like this presentation format. Apparently it's all the rave, all over. Well, it was started in Japan, apparently it happens here a lot. But uh, like in May, I had already been trying to work on this poem about my dad, which maybe, I, maybe I'll read. Maybe I'll read that one, we'll see. And anyway, uh, so someone invited me to participate. And the setup is, uh, it's, like a slide, it's like a slide presentation meets a slam or something. So they give everybody a topic and you come, you, you can send in advance your images. So there's 20 images, they flash for 20 seconds each, and then you do your presentation. So you're kind of looking at the images, but not really, right? They just flash in 20 seconds each. So each one takes about six minutes and 40 seconds. Uh, and if you do like a Wikipedia, you'll see. I mean, it's apparently big. You know, I actually heard something about it on uh, NPR recently, even though they pronounced it wrong, I think. Or I'm pronouncing it wrong. Somebody's wrong. But uh, so anyway, so I, I participated. And the, the topic then was like open systems. So they said, do whatever you want to do. You know, it's a picha kucha around open systems. So I was like, okay, great. So I worked on it really hard, and you know, my wife was watching me, and she said, uh, you sure it's not just like a slideshow? And I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> So I had all these crazy images, like an image of a little boy on his dad's shoulder, and the boy's got his whole fist shoved up in the boy's mouth. And I'm like, yeah, open systems, open systems. You know? <laughs> so, uh, so then I go, and uh, I'm the second person. So the first person goes, and she does a side presentation. Like, open systems, me and computer science, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> so then I got up and I did it, and everybody was quiet, you know, bizarre, crazy stuff. So all I did was use, like, for each 20 seconds, I just had, like, snippets of my favorite poems. Not mine, but other people's poems, like Baraka, you know, 20 seconds, and there's an image of, like, Kara Walker, you guys know the black and white cutouts, and the poem is, like, poems of bullshit. Uh, they would shoot, come at you, you know, all kind of crazy stuff. But it's not me. It's Baraka. But the kids are like, So then I finished, and I was like, oh, that was terrible. And my wife was like, well, it was kind of interesting, but you were way off on the assignment. <laughs> so then I said, oh, you know what? I wish I could like, do that with my own work. I wish I could like, lay out 20 images and then 20 seconds, 20 second poems, 20, 20 second poems around images. So that's what I've been trying to figure out. So that was like May, and I've been doing them. Uh, and maybe I'll read. The one that I think is finished is the one about my dad, but that's a little too intense. Like the last time I read that thing, it was just it was way too much. So, so this is like a new one. Uh, I never say like what the sections are. I just sort of read it like it's a regular poem. But you can almost think of it as like scenes or something, a bunch of scenes. So it's called Tracks for My Brother, I think, and The Ex-Brothers. I think that's what it's called. So. Uh, the sort of impetus for it is that, you know, like Malcolm X, this is connected to somehow, it's connected to the week somehow. Uh, Malcolm X, you know, he had two older brothers that were also in the nation with him, Filbert X and uh, Wilfred X, right? So when he was assassinated, those two brothers, the day of his assassination, they didn't go to his funeral, they went to uh, the Founders Day convention with the Nation of Islam, for um, Elijah Muhammad, who probably has something to do with Malcolm X's assassination. So what always interested me in that story was that they missed their brother's funeral, you know? And I was like, oh, they're like, they're gone and they've pretty much aligned themselves with, with their religion as opposed to like with family. So there's like a question about, you know, what trumps what. But also how I think it's connected. It's also like the wrong side of history because I think, oh, I'm sure they feel like idiots now. They might not have known in 1965 that Malcolm X would become Malcolm X. They thought he was just their brother. So they said, I'm not gonna go to my brother's funeral. And they say, when they're on stage, they say things like, well, you know, he, he got too ahead of himself. He thought he was bigger than us, blah, blah, blah. Really sort of disparaging him. And it's like, well, it turns out he was right. So <laughs> the wrong side of history is really how I think that's related. Like, you know, what does it mean to be sort of like, even like right now, to be on the wrong side of history, whatever sort of, history we see going forward, right? Like if you look forward into history, that makes any sense? Time of I seeing in physics, you know? Thinking about like looking forward that way and saying, oh, you know, who are the people who are like saying, you know, JFK was wrong and he was a socialist and who are the people who are saying, 
you know, MLK was a, was a communist and un-American and thinking about those people being on the wrong side of history and then vanishing from history because suddenly they decide they never said that. So who are the people now that are on the wrong side of history? That's the question. And it has nothing to do with anything I just said. <laughs> <laughs> I dreamed my brother, the prophet, said I'd live with the feeling a child feels the first time he sees his brother disappear. I went down on my knees, and sure enough, I was the size of a boy again, with my shin bones like two shiny tracks against the ground. I could almost hear a train carrying its racket up my spine. On this day in 1965, the brothers of Malcolm X were in the Dixieland Motel out for Route 3 watching The Widow X on the black and white portable TV. If I was in this story, I would run the assassins down and remove their eyes. It does not matter if this is true, only that it can be conceived. I like to go walking in the woods when they are just shy of green, but I like sitting in a room with curtains dripping with lamplight too. I know a man playing piano an hour straight for no one to hear is not playing music because no one can prove it. And I know that the ones who can sing should sing for the ones who can't. However else fiction functions, it fills you with the sound of crows chirping, alive, alive, alive. That's temporary, too. Tell my story begs the past as if it was a prayer for the next life. Turn me loose, I like to say, when it clings to me like meat, like feathers and rainfall, soaked but retaining their grace. I am considering writing a story about the lives the brothers lead afterward. They will change their names a third time and abandon their families. They will visit their brother's grave at Fern Cliff. They will be poor and empty. One will bag the dead man's bones while the one holding the shovel begs him to hurry. I keep thinking about the dream of the big black bear stuffed in a corner of the bar me and my brother used to haunt. Our fingers were not so yellow then. The plans in our mouths were cloudy. There will be one or two scenes with the ex-brothers in a bar like that one, with quiet smoke and whiskey staining their teeth, and the bear will be a metaphor for something. I have no problem with the flaws of memory. The bird carcass stiff as a shoe of a hit and run victim on the side of a road might just be a veil, the wind pulled from the face of a hitchhiking widow. Why was the imagination invented not to remake? For setting, the Dixieland twin beds will be narrow and covered with a dingy floral embroidery. On each pillow will be a sweating peppermint candy left by Lucy Ann, the nutty desk clerk who'll say, damn, both of y'all look like Malcolm X, but that can't be. They buried him up in New York today. I'm thinking of three brothers walking a dirt road with a white boy who'd seen only a summer before a black man strung up at the edge of town. They'll be singing when they drag the white boy to the river and throw him in. Just over the hill, the white boy's family will be picnicking. A hog on a split will be roasted beyond the color of sundown. How happy they'll seem. So the idea was to use details based on every interesting person I've met in my life. But as you can see, all the characters look alike. Blind Vince Twain, blacker than most, a real name, black, I know somebody with a name blacker than most, blacker than most, Epiphany Johnson, Dead Eye Sue, Little L, Fat Nasty, Jump Johnson, Sister Clementine, Lou DeVille. I should write a whole novel about each of them tonight. I always keep two guns hidden on me, one tied to my shin and the other tucked in my pants for company. I do not kill anyone, though my angel tells me to, because I think it's revolting and contrived. The brothers will be kept alive and thinking about their brother, dead and departing on a train into a mountainside. My eyes will find the chin of the widow quivering 
below a new black veil. She's already a stranger to them. Where is home now, she'll think. It will be the wind or her trembling that moves the veil like wind. I am not going to say anything about the widow's face because I want, to, I want you to think of her as an ageless bride. When I try remembering dirt, I remember my mother's pale carpet stained by its intrusion and my brother on his knees with a hairbrush and a bar of soap scrubbing before school. I do not know the names of birds or flowers, the wild sounds vibrating outside the house, but I know it's raining harder right now than it did last night. One brother will tell the other a story. Once in the shadow of a tree lit with bird song, when a black woman unbuttoned her blouse, all the birds came to dine. There are two kinds of people, the ones who root and the ones who roam, the ones bound to a place and the ones bound to an idea, whatever the idea may be. I would like to be as people think I am, instead of a man who slanders those who love him repeatedly. I imagine my brother must be 100 pounds heavier now than he was last year. If growing old is like slipping into a new coat without taking the old coat off, he's got the weight of his family. There's smoke in his mouth when he speaks to me. You'll find salt in the eyes of anyone who kneels long enough with his head in the dirt. I should tell you what happened to my brother when he was 16. My mother found him naked and weeping to himself in the hall closet. Because I was not there, there is no suitable place in the story for this scene. Later, both ex-brothers will show up at the widow ex's door and miss the softer woman she was. Here, I am not going to ask for forgiveness because woe is a garment worn to wear. At their backs will be cold weather and their jackets will be wet with heaviness. They call me Silver Tongue. Because I am brother of the dragon, they call me Dragonfly. It's true, destruction teaches us to grow, but I never wanted to survive. I have an insomniac's sense of time. I am so lit from within, I could set myself aflame. It's true, the pair of tracks through the darkness, the black guys up for nothing disguised, the bewilderment that cannot be described. What I feel is why. In fiction, everything happens with ease and the easefulness kills me. If I were in this story, I would send my sister-in-law my eyes. I'm full of dirt sometimes, blood of the hound. I promise nothing I write tomorrow will have a subtext. There will be no scenes in which all meanings reflected through subtlety. And when my fiction fails, you can bet I'll drag myself to your arms, crying, speak to me. All right, so you know that's mostly for me more than for y'all. I think that's all right. You can tell me if y'all like it, though, and then I'll, I'll, I'll never read it again for you. All right, uh, let's see. So, so these are new poems, too. None of them are that long. I don't, I don't think I'm going to read the other poem because it's, you know, it's just long. It takes energy. So I'll just I'll, I'll, you know, read a couple more new poems, and then we'll be done. Let's see here. Uh, should I read that one? I guess that's sort of like in the same spirit. So this poem, um, Shakur, is the name of this poem that I guess I'll read next. And uh, you know, obviously, it's like Tupac Shakur is in there somewhere. Because um, you know, like, but Tupac Shakur means like Shakur means like thanks be to God or something. So I think it's something like that too. Uh, but the deal is, I was uh, in Nebraska with this crazy poet. I won't say his name, but he's lived in Nebraska for a long time. So that's driven him crazy. <laughs> And I, we were just talking about some story where these two white kids, I guess they were a couple, had been doing meth. And then uh, they pulled over on the side of the road uh, in the winter, I guess. It might, yeah, I'm sure, sure it was the winter. Uh, and then they, they took a nap. And then they froze to death, you know, because it was Nebraska. So I kept thinking about that. And I kept thinking about Tupac Shakur, like on the radio, as this happens. And the, the music sort of washing them over as they, they fall asleep. So it's called Shakur. And again, you know, this, yeah, I mean, you can tell me later on 
anybody got any uh, advice, <clears throat> I probably won't listen. But Shakur, Shakur, I'm coming at you live from the halfway out where the winter morning stretches out like a white sheet over lovers the infinite has fetched. The still and bone blue white couple found parked, frozen on the highway. I'm thinking of them and the drug that made them think they were warm enough to chill. Because I know staying alive requires pills and a wicked streak. I'd need a head cocooned in base. I'd need to be locked in a womb to hear your dopey two-note medley, your song pimped by wreckage, your light longing for lightness. I'd have to be as quiet as the youths whose youth made them stupid and lovely. They are God's niggas now, like you. I'm thinking of the stall of intoxicated cool that stalled you before it stalled them. I know men who want to die this way, smoke like snow tattooing their bodies with narcotic holiness, the glaze of status, the faux lacquer of bliss. I'm coming at you live, frostbitten, and thinking language is for losers. Who cannot think our elegies are endless, endlessly, the words we put to them too often unheard and hurried. I'm coming at you live from the intangible. Do you want to ride or die crowded into a small space spitting, come with me? One day, my song will be called The Language is for Lovers. One day, desire will not be a form of wickedness. And when you offer your drug, oh ghost, I'll resist. Can y'all still hear me? Sometimes I feel like I'm projecting, other times I don't. Are we doing a Q&A? We're not doing a Q&A, right? How was your voice? <laughs> no, I could do I could do a Q&A, I guess. If y'all had any questions, I hope you don't have any questions. If you have questions, that means I failed. That means the poems aren't working, if you have questions. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, but I'll answer. Okay, you know, here, okay, two more. I'll, this is a short one. I'll try. This one, too, like I, uh, I guess it's called At the Door of the Mothership or something. You know, I don't have, I think it's called anosmia. Like, I don't have a real good sense of smell. I'm really thinking, like, everything's all jacked up. Ear, nose, and throat. You know, it's all connected. <clears throat> That's probably why I've lost my voice, because I can't smell. So this has something to do with that. At the door of the mothership. But it's also about funk. With a nose that can't function, you'll likely scorn the smell of fever on our breaths. Each tongue poked with liquor veins of fire, and pores of fire's opposite. But you'll never have a cure for death. If you pinch your nose, you won't know what wind devoting its hours to motion knows. You won't be wooed by oozings lying on your belly between a lover's thighs singing mothership, mothership, mothership. You won't smell the blood's flesh blurring rhetoric if you never inhale, you won't love survival as much as the ones who survive. Singing, swing down, sweet chariot, stop and let me ride. You have to want your funk uncut. If you're too broke down or muzzled, too sober, cold-shouldered, hardcore, or austere. If you're turning your snivel up, desanctifying the air, turn tail, baby because your sick ass should not be here. Okay. Uh, and this, so this is the last one. It's called Lighthead's Guide to Addiction. And if you are addicted to sleep, a bay of fresh coffee may help. If you are addicted to coffee, teach yourself to break dance. If you are addicted to dancing, polio will cure you. If you hear that the last black man alive will be burned at sunset, find an underground railroad. If you are addicted to railroads, try wearing undersized shoes. No one knows where your mother has gone with her tax refund. If you are addicted to shoes, move to a village in Japan. If you are addicted to Japan, 
Try eating with no teeth. If you are addicted to teeth, visit the wife beater's widow. She will be upstairs awaiting your caress. I often wake up horny. If you are addicted to masturbation, seek company. If you are addicted to company, try starlight and silence. If you are addicted to silence, find guard dogs, traffic, or infants. If you are addicted to infants, try reliable contraception. <laughs> or try asking yourself, what's wrong with me? <laughs> if you are addicted to contraception, try recklessness. Try riding an unsaddled horse until you are thrown into a bed of gravel. If you are addicted to recklessness, try a spoon-fed disease. My mother loves imagining the day she'll die. If you are addicted to disease, visit an old world doctor. If you are addicted to doctors, try war. If you are addicted to sorrow, all my talk about loss is not lost to you. No one knows why your father built a shed for his weapons, probably some hellified form of addiction. If you are addicted to weapons, please find the people who plan to burn the last black man alive at sunset for me. <laughs> or try learning a little history. Obviously, I'm addicted to repetition, which is a form of history. If you are addicted to history, try a blindfold of razors or buy a Cadillac. If you are addicted to Cadillacs, try poverty. No one is addicted to poverty. But if you are, try wealth. If you are addicted to wealth, you need money. If you are addicted to money, you need money. Try that.